I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. In this episode, we'll be talking about origami, HTML5 game development, form labels, and more. Let's check it out. First up is origami. This is a project from Facebook that works with Quartz Composer on the Mac, and it can help you prototype your apps before you actually get into a whole bunch of coding and waste a lot of time. So here's the website for it, a free design pro prototyping toolkit for Quartz Composer made by the Facebook design team. And basically it allows you to drag a bunch of nodes together in this node editor and you can add various properties to each one and then boom, look at that. You can prototype behavior in your app before you have to write a ton of code. So it details everything that's included. You can do all sorts of cool transitions. And to get started, you need an Apple, you need to register as an Apple developer, download and install Quartz Composer, and then you need to download and install Origami. So, if you want to try a new way of prototyping apps, I highly recommend you check it out. That is, that is so nice and say, you know, just save so much time before actually coding all that, having a meeting about it. Okay, back to the drawing board. No, just pop it into origami, ready to go. Bam. Next up, we have a project called Molecule, and this is pretty interesting. It is an HTML5 game development framework. Now, this framework gives you a lot of different components that you would need to use when creating your own game, and it uses HTML5, as you might expect, from the part that says HTML5 Game Framework. So, what does it have? Well, it's fast, lightweight, easy to learn, and cross-platform. I know that because it says it all across the type of, uh, top of the screen. No, but what's really nice about it is it gives you a physics library, which you really don't need to spend time writing yourself, as well as animation and tiled support. So let's check out some examples of things that you can do with the Molecule Framework. So it, they, it's really nice, this site, they break it down into three different sections, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. Let's check out the uh, beginner section right here. One of the uh, basic things that you can do is move a sprite. So see that, we got our little character moving across the screen right there. Now what's nice about the examples on this page is that it shows you all of the code you need to use to get this working. Now look at how little code that is, in 25 lines there, they've done a whole animation of a sprite. Now if you want to know what you can really get going here, let's check out the advanced section. And look at that, it's almost like a small Pac-Man clone that they call Maze. And if you ask me, it's amazing. So anyway, uh, not too much code involved there. You can see they break it down into a, a game function, player function, and just have a ton of sprites moving around here. Now we're not, not going to go into everything here, but this does also work on mobile devices as well. So you can check that out at moleculejs.net. We'll also have a link to it in our show notes, which you can get to at youtube.com slash gotreehouse, or search for us on iTunes at The Treehouse Show. You know, that's very impressive. It looks like they include pretty much everything that you would need to create a basic HTML5 game. I think the thing that impresses me the most is the tile map because that's actually something that isn't even included with SpriteKit in wow. iOS. Wow. And that's a very important piece when you're trying to build like a, a side scroller game or a top down RPG game. So it's nice to have that tile map there already pre built for you. Next up is a new light box. I know there's a ton of light boxes out there. Yeah, why would we cover it here? Well, this person didn't like any of them, and I can see why when they explain their needs. They just wanted to show an image, so you click on the image, the image comes up, very minimal, and that's pretty much it. In fact, they have a demo further down here. Let's take a look at that. So here they have this nice image gallery. You click, and an image comes up, and if you click on the left or right sides of the image, it will actually scroll through to the next image and you can click off to the side to make the light box go away. Now the problem with other light boxes that this person encountered was that they had a lot of really bad markup or they included tons of features that you just didn't need. Everybody seems to be trying to make the ultimate light box solution that has 
absolutely everything you could possibly need. But this is a pretty lightweight, minimalistic jQuery plugin, and it even works with, works with jQuery 1 or 2. So if you're still on jQuery 1, it will totally work uh, for your app. Pretty cool stuff. Very nice. Next up, we have a project called iCheck. This lets you create customized checkboxes, radio buttons, and a couple more things. Now, uh, why would you want to customize your checkboxes? Well, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at a little demo and example here. If you want to have these different graphical checkboxes and radio buttons and scrolling buttons, this is actually pretty difficult to do uh, with straight up styling. So this plugin will allow you to do all that and it even includes a couple different skins. They've got a minimal skin that you can see right here, a square skin, flat, line, Polaris, Futurico, and more. Now, there are a ton of different options that you can use with this. Um, some of the features are right here. It's identical inputs across different browsers and devices. This is, gonna, this is gonna be super important when you're creating your app and skinning it and wanting it to have a consistent user experience across all of your different devices. Another super important thing here is screen reader accessible inputs. This is actually quite difficult to do if you're just writing something yourself. Now, it's version 1.0.1 right now, but version 2.0 is in the works, which has a performance boost and a few more options. So this is definitely one to check out. Stay tuned. Yeah, that's very cool. It is notoriously difficult to style form elements like that, especially checkboxes. So yeah. very nice stuff. Some CSS frameworks don't even bother. Yeah. Yeah, they're just like, nope, not me. Do something else. Shame. Yeah. Next up is form label design. So speaking of forms, we have a little bit more for you here. There is an attribute called placeholder, and very commonly it's used in place of a form label, but that's actually not appropriate for semantic and accessibility reasons. You really do need to have a label there. So the label element will, as the name implies, label the, the form element, so you have the label and then you have the actual input area, whereas the placeholder attribute on an input will have this sort of gray text that you commonly see, and when you click, the text goes away. It just gives you a placeholder or an idea of what type of data you should be putting in there. But they're not interchangeable. They're not the same thing, and you can create a form field without a placeholder, but you do need to have a label. But the placeholders are pretty nice, so what do you do? Well, there's this pretty wonderful solution in this iOS app where you can start typing something in, and then the label will just float right above the input area as soon as input begins. Well, here we have a version for the web. And there's a little example here done through CodePen. So as you can see, there is a placeholder right here. And when I click and start typing my name, you can see that the label appears right above the text. And they give an example of what that markup looks like. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, definitely be sure to check out this blog post to read more. But uh, I think it's a pretty wonderful solution to this particular problem. Yeah, I really like that. Next up, Nick, you might not need jQuery. Really? Are you sure? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. That's well, crazy. I think it depends on your specific situation. But there is a new website called You Might Not Need jQuery that addresses different instances where you guessed it. You might not need jQuery. Can you guess the address of this website? You might not need jQuery. Com. Wow, dude, you are good. Wow. So anyway, this is actually pretty great. Um, it goes through and shows you, hey, you only need to support IE9 and up. Well, hey, buddy, this is your code. This is what the jQuery looks like, and this is the absolutely equivalent JavaScript code that will work great in IE or another modern browser. But Jason, in a lot of these examples, it looks like there's far more code for plain JavaScript. Yes, that is quite correct, Nick. And actually, it's something we kind of beat to death on this show here. Um, as the web evolves, mobile device connections don't necessarily evolve along with it. So any opportunity you have to save some space, be it uh, via a JavaScript library or a lack of one, is a great thing to check out. 
So that's what this website is hoping to address, finding common use cases and presenting you the different code that goes along with these use cases that you can then implement on your own site. So even though this looks like more code, it's also uh, in exchange for not including jQuery, which is actually much less code. Yes, so more is less. Got it. Get it? Makes Conversely, sense. less can be more. It, it works both ways. Right. All right, very cool stuff. Next up, we're going to take a look at the origins of common UI symbols. So we have this wonderful little animation here. It goes through a couple of different common UI symbols. So there's like power off, Bluetooth, FireWire, that sort of stuff. And this is almost like a nice little storybook. So if I click this arrow over here, boom, look at that. Boom. There is power. There's what the symbol looks like. And it tells you exactly where this particular symbol came from. And there's 11 of these. So there's command, as you might find on a Mac. There's the Bluetooth symbol, USB, and so on. It's not particularly useful, but it's very fascinating. And I feel like these are symbols that we see all the time. And it's kind of interesting to know where they came from. They weren't just made up arbitrarily. A lot of them have very specific specific reasoning behind them. Yeah, it's possible that the at symbol dates back to the 6th century, where monks had it mean toward. And now it's used on Twitter. And coincidentally, we are toward the end of the show where we usually give our Twitter names. Who are you on Twitter? I am at Nick RP. And I am at Jay Cypher. For more information on anything we talked about, check out the show notes at youtube.com slash go treehouse. You can also subscribe to this podcast in iTunes, search for The Treehouse Show, and then subscribe and rate. Of course, if you'd like to see more videos like this one about web design, web development, mobile business, and so much more, be sure to check us out at teamtreehouse.com. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next week.